Ooh, fancy graphics. Hello everyone, my name is Samuel Ryman and this is Samuel's Racing Show. And we have a lot to talk about because there's been a lot of uh, racing news happening off track recently. But also on the track we had uh, some drama last weekend at Talladega as anticipated. Unfortunately, even though we got the kind of drama we're used to seeing at Talladega, aka Rex, they started wrecking on lap number one, we also got the bad kind of drama. The drama where we're all arguing about the yellow line rule at the end of a race. And I do li like a point that Dale Jr. brought up, which is, we're going to wreck at Talladega anyway. You know, if a yellow line exists to prevent us from wrecking, then obviously it's not doing its job. So let's go ahead and get rid of it. Fair point. The other thing, though, is I think a yellow line also exists so that cars that are broken down can run on down on the apron and be out of harm's way, relatively out of harm's way anyway. Uh, so so here's, here's how I would change it, if anything. I would go to our very own iRacing Lionheart IndyCar series and pick up the yellow line rule we have over there. And that is, you can't race on the apron unless it's the final lap. And now, here's why I think this is a great idea. If you go below the apron to advance your position on any other lap of a race at Talladega, you, uh, can, you can serve a penalty. You can give up the position that you gained. You have time to do that. You don't really have time to do that on the final lap, and no one's going to do it. So, you know, on the final lap, all bets are off. If anyone's limping around on the apron thinking they're safe on the final lap at Talladega, they're an idiot. Or Daytona. Because um, if a pack is coming up behind you, there's a pretty good chance they're going to wreck. If it's the final lap of a race. So you don't want to be on the apron, you don't want to be anywhere around that pack. So that's how I would change it, if anything. Keep the yellow line rule. For the first 187 or 199 laps, whatever the case may be. So that if a driver does advance their position by going below the yellow line, they just back off, yield the position, and then get going again. But on the final lap, all bets are off. And you can race wherever the bloody hell you want on the final lap. That's just my suggestion. I also want to point out the fact that I think Denny Hamlin knew exactly what he was doing on the last lap at Talladega. He knew that the cars in front of him were coming down low and he knew that if he just held it wide open, mashed the gas and went to the apron, he could use the excuse post-race, oh, I was forced b below the yellow line to avoid a collision. Even though I think he kind of drove down there and made that his racing line knowing he could get away with that argument and I'm not saying that was a wrong thing to do because I think given everything he knew and everything NASCAR had enforced that that's exactly what was going to happen and exactly what should happen I just think Denny Hamlin knew exactly what he was doing <laughs> On the final lap there, he said, I'm going to the apron, I'm holding it wide open, I'm arguing that they forced me below the line, and uh, hey, if they take a win away from me, what the hell has Denny Hamlin got to lose, you know? Black flag him, whatever, whatever the heck, he's probably going to make a final four anyway. We'll get to talking about more about the final four in just a couple moments. Okay, that's a couple moments, let's talk about the final four. Um, I'm not... I'm still not convinced Kyle Busch is going to make it. And I go back to what I said on my discussion with James Crahula a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were talking about his loss to Kevin Harvick at Bristol. And I want to stand by my statement that I think that was a big loss for Kyle Busch. It seemed to get him down. He lost his motivation. It kind of... Mentally defeated, I think someone used as an expression somewhere. I'm not sure you can ever say Kyle Busch was mentally defeated, but I don't think he's in the best place right now compared to where he's been in the past. And when you look at the four drivers who are on the outside looking in 
uh, to make the round of eight heading into this weekend's cutoff race at the Charlotte Roval. They're Kyle Busch, Austin Dillon, Clint Boyer and Eric Almirola. And honestly, I would argue that those are the four that should go out. Um, I think they are the four lesser performing drivers of the 12 that are currently competing in NASCAR's playoff system. And one of the drivers on the inside in the top eight that they would have to beat is Alex Bowman. Let's go ahead and give him a shout out because as I've mentioned before, he's a bit of a sentimental favorite of mine. Um, uh, Having had my friend Bryce Whitson work uh, for his team in the past. And I think it is great that Alex Bowman is going to the 48 alongside his crew tree for Greg Ives. Those two have been doing uh, fantastic work together. I think he's, what, only in his second or third year with Hendrick Motorsport still. And already here we see him making the round of eight. Even if he doesn't make a round of four, that's still a heck of an accomplishment. And um, I, I, I see them going good places. Now, it will be interesting to see if next year Hendrick has a three-car team or a four-car team. And, of course, there's arguments uh, to the advantages of having smaller teams. Each car gets a bit more focus, whereas bigger teams, of course, in NASCAR, you've got more friends to help you out on the track, and that's always a good thing. Hendrick, if it does go to a three-car team, It's like the one team I want to see do well in 2021. Now, what the hell do I mean by that? I think in many instances in NASCAR and Formula One, you don't really want your favorite team to be performing well next year. If Ferrari are going to Formula One as a specific example here, if Ferrari or Red Bull perform poorly in 2021, I'm not going to be too concerned. Because to me, that's telling me that they're putting their resources behind the new rules change for 2022. Likewise, in NASCAR, obviously a good example, uh, a good uh, team to single out here is the Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin team. I didn't say LeBron James this time. Kahula, I got it right. Um, You know. I kind of want Bubba Wallace to do bad in 2021, and not because I don't like him, but because I I believe there is some validity to the theory that the worse you perform in 2021, mm, the better you might be performing in 2022 if the team's directing their resources there. So, uh, But of course, Hendrick Motorsports, mm, they're, they're kind of in a similar position to... Well, not similar position, but they're still up there to, I was going to say, to Mercedes in Formula One in that they're already towards the top. Um, So, you know, they can afford to put a little bit in column A, a little bit in column B and have a good 2021 and 2022 seasons. Before we move on from NASCAR and over to Formula One, I also want to give IMSA a shout out. The... uh, uh, WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, the GTLM and GTD categories are going to be racing at the Charlotte Roval. I think that's a Saturday night race, maybe a Friday night race. And I think that's really cool that we're getting a two-hour sprint race there for the IMSA guys alongside NASCAR at uh, one of the more modern, exciting, newer road courses out there. And I hope those guys put on a great show and get some great publicity. And also it might rain this weekend. So we'll see where that goes. Another place where it might rain is over in the Nürburgring. Not the giant Nürburgring Nordschleife, unfortunately. But the Nürburgring Grand Prix course that Formula One has been racing at since 1990-something. 1980-something, actually. I think they started going back there in the 80s. And, of course, one of the top headlines there is going to be can Lewis Hamilton get his 91st win and tie Michael Schumacher? Well, if it rains, that's probably going to increase his chances because he does seem to be one of the best drivers in the wet in Formula 1 right now. 
And there was a little bit of a stir a couple of days ago earlier this week where Sir Jackie Stewart was making comments, uh, kind of the old grandpa comments of, eh, back in my day, you know, uh, Formula One cars were much harder to drive and Lewis Hamilton has got it easy. And yeah, there were some people a bit disappointed in Sir Jackie Stewart on saying stuff like that on social media or the press, wherever he ended up saying it. Uh, because, you know, he's kind of diminishing the accomplishment of someone who has had an immense amount of success in Formula One and someone who's done a lot of hard work to get to it. That person, of course, being Lewis Hamilton. But, you, you know, there's there's truth to that. But at the same time, I hate it when people say, oh, I don't like Jackie Stewart anymore or... or you know, um, oh, this makes me look poorly on such and such a person. Because at the end of the day, he's an old guy. <laughs> and I, I feel that every couple of years as someone, there's a Jensen Button or a Damon Hill or a Mario Andretti or a Sir Jackie Stewart or someone, you know, a former race car driver that is regarded very highly, that has some controversial, conservative outdated opinion that they put out in the media there. Bernie Eccleston, is, of course, is full of them. And I hate it when we kind of diminish their past accomplishments based on what we're saying now. Because guess what, people? In about 60 years, we're all going to be old too and probably saying some things that make the uh, generation, whatever the hell they call the generation in the 60 years' time, that are going to make us sound like the old farts. So, you know... I still give Sir Jackie Stewart a hell of a lot of credit for all of the safety innovations he has helped pioneer in Formula One. And if he's a bit of an old grandpa with outdated opinions about, uh, you know, the racing drivers back in the day were better and all that kind of stuff. And the uh, modern Grand Prix drivers that uh, don't know what it's like, well, then he can have those opinions, I suppose. Uh, obviously some big news in Formula One this week about Honda pulling out. Very unfortunate there in that that's the one new engine manufacturer that, uh, I guess not even an engine manufacturer, power unit supplier that Formula One gained in the hybrid era and now they're going away. Doesn't really look good for Formula One. Uh, maybe it gives Formula One a bit of a kick up the butt saying, hey, make a... Make less complicated and cheaper engines so that, you know, people want to build engines for you guys again. And we, we can end up with a bunch of different constructors and have 26, 28 cars on the grid fighting for pre-qualifying, qualifying. You know, all that good stuff again. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is a bit of a kick up the butt that will make that happen. Or maybe Red Bull will start building their own engines and Formula One will go about nothing ever happened which would be interesting to see although i did see uh, someone brought up a pretty valid claim on reddit on the formula one reddit thread that uh what happens if red bull start building their own engine and they're not any good and red bull now is kind of burned all of its bridges and doesn't have a very competitive car whatsoever um what does it do then and the answer is um don't know, but it wouldn't look good, would it? For Formula One or for Red Bull. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that Max Verstappen's kind of in the middle of all of this. Knowing the amount of talent he has, you can argue whether he's better than Hamilton or not. But it's a shame that he's going to start. Well, I think, well, he's still in his young 20s, so he's still far, far away from the peak of his Formula One career. But he's going to start getting old before too long. And, uh, you know, these are all missed opportunities of championships that he could be fighting for while he's dealing, dealing with all the political turmoil of uh, racing for Red Bull. Kind of say the same kind of thing about Charles Leclerc at Ferrari. So hopefully those two organisations will eventually get their act together. Leclerc and Verstappen will end up with great rides. And Carlos Sainz too. And all of the drivers in this upcoming generation. And fight 
put on some great fights for us in a decade going forward. Which leads us to the next point. Talking about the next generation, Mick Schumacher. He's going to be doing practice soon. The hot rumour is that he will be racing in Formula 1 for Alfa Romeo alongside Kimi Raikkonen in 2021. I'd be alright with that. Um, we'll wait for Kimi Raikkonen to go away, but while he's outperforming his teammate, why should he? I, I don't have anything really against Alfa Romeo giving Antonio Drioffinazzi the boot. I don't really think he's... Um, Top class material. I mean, obviously, he's good. He can make it into Formula One, but I don't think he'll ever make it to the front in Formula One. Prove me wrong if you can, Antonio. Um, but I do find it kind of funny that Kimi Raikkonen, the person that they brought in to replace Michael Schumacher the first time he retired, is now about to be teammates with Michael Schumacher's son. I find that. I find that humorous. Is that ironic? I think that's ironic. You wouldn't really expect him to re replace someone and then be teammates. I think it is. Uh, another bit of Formula One news. Um, the Interlagos circuit, its future may be in question. It looks like the Brazilian government are uh, spending taxpayers' money there to cut down a bunch of trees in Rio and set up a new F1 circuit in Rio, even though they had a Formula One circuit in Rio in the past. Whatever happened to that place, I'm not really sure. Um, obviously, it would be unfortunate Interlagos going away, although I, I, I stand by the fact that I don't think Interlagos always produces great tra races in the dry, but the wet races there are classics, and it normally rains when they go to Brazil. I guess I understand why Brazil is doing it from a tourism stand uh, point of view. Uh, Interlagos has had a bit of a rough history in the past where people have gotten robbed outside of a circuit. It's surrounded by slums. What? Slums? Slums? There we go. Um, and, you know, I don't know if the location in Rio would be any better, but maybe that's what they're thinking there. They're trying to get it into a better area. I'm not really sure, but cutting down the whole bunch of trees eh, doesn't exactly sound great, but it seems to be what they're going to go ahead and do. So, um, oh, well, uh, there's a petition out there to see if they can stop that, but I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure if, you know, they, they've already pretty much uh, decided on that. Uh, so let's go back to talking about something more positive, because I talked about Mick Schumacher joining Kimi and my opinions on Kimi and Antonio Giovinazzi. What are my opinions on Mick Schumacher? I think I like him. Um, in that I was a little concerned when I first heard about him rising through the ranks and, you know, not always running up front in various support series, but yet he was working his way up ladder. But now here he is in Formula 2. He seems to be able to put on consistently strong results, uh, a variety of different tracks. So, so even when he has bad days, he's able to finish up towards the front. He's had a couple of uh, unfortunate incidents this season, a collision with his teammate. Uh, there's been a couple of instances where he could have had a penalty called on him, maybe, and didn't got away with it. But he also had some bad luck with a fire extinguisher going off in the cockpit of Austria. So I think those kind of things kind of outweigh each other. Um, but the thing that's really impressed me watching him this season, I think he is really good at the opening lap of a race. He's able to make up a few positions. Uh, that seems to be something he's able to do consistently. So, um, you know, if he can carry that over to Formula 1, um, that'll be a, a great boon to have in, in uh, Alfa Romeo because, you know, if that car's qualifying 13th, 14th on the grid, ooh, make a few positions up at the start. You're fighting inside the points right at the start of the race. So, uh, we'll see. That'd be definitely cool to see. I also think he... He must have had an immense Im amount of pressure on him his entire career. And he's, you know, he he's obviously dealt with it well because he's leading the Formula 2 points. So hopefully for him, the pressure of being a Formula 1 driver 
should be a breeze. Um, yeah, now going through my notes here, this is a, I, I like a setup, this makes things a, a whole lot easier here, have all my notes up on the screen, that's why I'm not always looking at you guys, uh, and I think we've covered everything, one final thing I'll give a shout out, the Lionheart IndyCar series, tonight, 10.30pm Eastern Time, on the iRacing Esports Network and the Global Sim Racing Channel, we're racing at Phillip Island, and, um, I hope I'm not jinxing myself here. I feel fast. I. How many top tens have you got this year, Samuel? As many as you. Unless, of course, you, the person watching, happens to be a Lionheart IndyCar Series driver who got a top ten, and then, okay, you have more than me. But if you're just someone sitting on the couch somewhere, then I have as many top tens in the Lionheart IndyCar Series as you do this year. But, uh, you know what? I might, I might have one more than you by the end of tonight. All right. Well, IMSA and NASCAR racing at the Charlotte Roval this weekend. Formula One at the Nürburgring. And MotoGP is racing at Le Mans. Not the full Cirque de la Sars, just like a shortened version of it. But, uh, and that race will be great anyway because it's MotoGP. Although it does seem like the championship is starting to have a, uh, Front runner now, after all the unpredictability of the opening few rounds. Looks like Fabio Quattaro may be able to run away with a sin. Maybe. Because each time someone starts to get a leg up on that championship, they end up having a crash. So who knows? Hey, let's see if we can do a graphic fade here to the end of the show. Do I know what I'm doing? Do I know what I'm doing? Ah, uh, I found it. All right. Bye-bye. Yay, it worked.